You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you, Judy. You guys can have a seat. Good morning. Sunday after Easter, good to see you all. If you're here for the first time, I'm Pastor Chris. Glad to have you, whether it's in person or online. I want to, uh, before we get going with the sermon and talking about the passage that Judy just read from, I want to um, make something uh, a little more clear um, for next week. We had a plan to be um, at First Baptist of Manasquan next week for an evening service because originally we were not able to use the school. We were told uh, when we were moving into the school, you can't use it on May 1st. There's a production. You know, you see this big stage here with the, we didn't do this. This isn't us thinking that this was a cool bag. This is the school. There's a production here next uh, weekend. And, and so they told us we couldn't use it. Um, so we, we booked ourselves at First Baptist of Manasquan. Many of you guys know we're planning to uh, plant a campus there, and we've been able to use their building, and uh, that church wants to partner with us in reaching that community. Um, and so we just said, let's, let's schedule an evening service there and do a baptism service. Well, this past week we found out that they double booked us. They have an event scheduled there. Um, and so, back to the drawing board. Um, so, whatever plans you made for next weekend. So, never mind. Okay? At the moment, plan to be here. We called the school again, and we said, hey, is that drama production by any chance canceled? Um, it wasn't canceled, but the, the woman looked at the books, and she said, you know, it's possible you'd be able to use it if you can just do a slightly shorter service um, and, and ha be out of the auditorium, specifically by 1130. The play's not till 2. Um, so she said, I'll get back to you after Easter break. So Easter break was this past week, so that means tomorrow we don't have the official answer. So for now, plan to be here at 10 a.m. next week, um, and, and the baptism is kind of up in the air. We'll figure that out hopefully by tomorrow. So if you can um, deal with a little bit of uncertainty, then uh, we, can, we can stick together, okay? Got it? All right, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to continue this series, As Told by a Scoundrel. This is a journey through the book of Matthew that we're taking. Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, he was known as a, a scoundrel to the religious conservatives of his time. I like to say that the tax collectors were sort of like a combination of a Tony Soprano and an ISIS sympathizer. That's kind of how they were seen. And, and yet he encountered Jesus, and his life was flipped upside down, and he ended up writing an account, the Gospel of Matthew, an account of Jesus' life, his death, his teachings, his resurrection. And so we're journeying through this, this book. Last week we took a break for Easter, and we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. Go figure, for Easter. Um, and we talked about how the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of uh, the Christian faith. Uh, the, the Christian faith hangs on the resurrection of Jesus. It does not hang on, in other words, the character of Christians. It does not hang on whether or not Christians are behaving appropriately and living up to the call that Jesus uh, uh, calls them to. And that's a good thing because how often do we see, whether it's in the news, the scandals, or, or in our own lives, the hypocrisy of Christians, right? Right? We see it on a regular basis. So thankfully, uh, the, 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 the credibility of Christianity might be hindered by the character of Christians, but the foundation is the resurrection of Jesus. That was last week. But this week, what I do want to start talking about, uh, how is uh, our character is important. <laughs> the character of Christians is important, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've watched... Recently, a documentary on one particular uh, megachurch, I won't say which one it was, um, but it was, it was just, it was frightening. It was scary. It was frustrating. It was like, ah, the way you make Jesus look, the way you make the church look. Um, it's frustrating. It's sobering. It's, it's scary. Um, and, and, and I want to talk for a little bit uh, over the next few weeks, um, as we pick up in the book of Matthew, um, we're going to be talking about w the character of the kingdom of God, like what it means. If we call ourselves Christians, if, if we be say we believe in the resurrection of Jesus, do we really live like it? Do we live like it? Like I ask myself a lot, do I really live like I believe this stuff? 
Like, is it, is it really affecting my life? Is it really affecting my family's life? Is it affecting our church community, your life, your family? If you, now, now, if you're here and you don't believe this and you're still saying, I'm still figuring this out, you're kind of off the hook today. Um, sometimes my effort is to try to get you to believe what I think is true. And sometimes it's for those who believe what I believe, live like it. Um, and so today is more about the latter. If you claim to be a Christian, are you living like it? So the, the, the theme for the next few weeks is going to be, I'm going to call it resurrection character. What it means to be changed by the hope, the future hope, and also the current power of the resurrection of uh, Jesus. Um, so we're going to be tracking through the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is laying out the character of the kingdom, the character of those who belong to him uh, and, and how it should be different. And so Judy kicked us off with a passage in verses 13 through 16 of Matthew. That's going to be our focus for today. Um, and, and over the next few weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll look at all kinds of things, revenge and murder and, you know, lust and money and worry and uh, loving your enemies, the kind of stuff that many people n know Jesus talked about um, but are impossible to obey. So le let me pray, and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue, okay? So, Lord, I, I, I thank you for everybody who's here. Thank you for everybody who's tuning in online. Um, thank you for spring. Thank you for the weather outside being beautiful. Um, God, we all come in here with baggage. We all come in here with concerns, anxieties, um, hurts, pain, regret. Uh, and I ask, Jesus, that you would speak to all of us. But especially today, especially those who claim to belong to you, claim to believe what we talked about last week. Are we living like it? Are we living like it? In your name I pray, amen. Okay, so Matthew 13 through 16, that's what Judy just read. I'm going to back it up two verses to Matthew 11. I'm going to summarize these passages, and then I'm going to lay out five implications for us, five practical implications and applications for us. So first, let's back it up to verse 11, just so we can see the full context. We looked at this two weeks ago. We'll just look at it again. Um, so uh, Jesus said, blessed are you, again, he's talking to his, his followers, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is saying, when people come against you and when they come against you because of me. So people might come against you and it might be because you're just being a jerk. And that's not what he's talking about. But when it's because of him, when it's because of a desire to live for him, to love like him, to treasure him, to talk about him as a treasure, people will come against you. They will slander you. They will misunderstand you. They will criticize you. In some parts of the world, they will kill you. And Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. Why can we rejoice and be glad? Because you belong to another kingdom. You belong to another world. Remember that this world is not your home. Remember that this world is not where you are to accumulate a bunch of comforts and pleasures. And like that's, if that was the case, if that was your goal, then yes, then this would not, persecution would not be a reason for rejoicing. But when you remember that this is a blip on the radar and you're going to reign with Jesus one day and you get the world one day with him because he comes back and he renews it and, and, and you get all that. When you get resurrection body, he's saying, you, you can rejoice and be glad. You can hold the things of this world loosely. Rejoice and be glad. And then he immediately flows into what we're going to see next, which is what Judy read. You are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. Now, why did he use the, the metaphor of salt? Salt was a preserving agent. It was used to preserve food in that time. You know, food would go bad. They didn't have refrigerators like you and I do. So they had salt on the food. It would preserve it. It would prevent the spread of decay. It was also used on wounds. You put salt on wounds, what happens? What does it feel like? Burns. It's like rubbing alcohol. Ah, burns you. But it also prevented the spread of decay. Um, so if you put it on food, it ah, tastes good. You put it on wounds, burns. Ouch. And Jesus is saying, you, my people, my followers, are the salt of the earth. You are a preserving agent that I am sprinkling around the earth to affect the earth. Some people are going to welcome it like salt on food, and some people are going to not like it like uh, salt on wounds. But either way, don't shrink back. Even if you are persecuted, don't shrink back. 
if you shrink back, if you get quiet, if you try to retaliate against uh, when people criticize you, then the salt will lose its saltiness. And then how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. The point of salt is to have an impact, to be different. If um, you poured salt on your uh, steak, and let's say the salt was insecure about being salt and said, you know what, I want to be like the rest of the steak. I want to taste just like steak. What's the point of having salt on your steak? Is that a stupid picture? <laughs> Can you follow? What's the point? Jesus is saying, if uh, you are the salt of the earth, I'm sprinkling you around the earth. If you try to fit in too much, if you are driven by the same thing the rest of the world is driven by, a desire for control or fame or money or what have you, what's the point? What's the point? And then he continues, you are the light of the world, a different metaphor. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Light was a uh, theme all throughout the Bible. Going back to Genesis, God said, let there be light, and there is light at the creation of the universe. And then later, the nation of Israel is called a light unto the Gentiles. So that the rest of the nations would see that the God Israel worshipped was the one true God. That was the point. Be a light unto the Gentiles, pointing to God as the ultimate light. And then Jesus came, light on the earth, the light of the world. And then Jesus says to his people, but my light is now being reflected through you in the world. You are the light of the world. You are called to go be light in darkness. Like the moon reflecting the sun. Jesus will return one day. We're going to get the sun in its ultimate form, right? Jesus, the presence of Jesus on the earth. But right now, the moon is meant to reflect the sun. You and I who belong to Jesus are meant to reflect the light of Jesus in a dark world. And so Jesus says, don't hide it. Don't put it under a bowl. Don't shrink back. Why would anybody put light under a bowl? Why would we want to do it? Be again, because of persecution, things get tough, criticism, misunderstanding. Don't do that, he says. Stay faithful. And people will glorify your Father in heaven. Um, even if they come against you. At the end of the day, they will see something different about you. The early Christians were known for... Um, doing things that were very different. They would go out and care for th those who were victims of plagues, even at the risk of catching the illness themselves and even dying for it. They were just risking their lives because they held on to their lives loosely. I know what's hap going to happen to me. I'm going to be resurrected so I can risk my life here. They were known as loving each other. It, it is written about non-Christian historians, my how they love each other. There should be something different about Jesus' people that makes others go, wow, they must really believe what they say they believe. Maybe that God that they claim to worship is actually something real, alive. My kids, all three of my kids have some degree of athletic ability. Some degree of it. When, whenever somebody who grew up with my wife sees them do something, I always, hear, I always see, or you know, whether it's on social media or whatever, I hear the same thing just like a mini Jess, or she's just like her mama, which I don't mind, because that's true. They get their, any of the, but it's from my, my wife, not from me. Um, but it's like they're saying, they're ch the child, my kid, is reflecting the DNA or the genes or the gifts of Jess. And that's what God, Jesus is saying should happen to you. You should reflect the character of the kingdom of God. You belong to a kingdom, a future kingdom, that is going to invade earth, you should give hints of that future kingdom, like salt on the earth. So that's kind of a summary of what Jesus is saying. Now, if you're taking notes, or you want to take notes, I'm going to lay out five implications and applications of this for us, okay? <coughs> or you can take a photo with your phone on the screen, and th that's an easier way to take notes. 
Number one, don't try to fit in because we're made to be different. I kind of said this already. I just want to be very explicit about it. If you claim to follow Jesus and belong to him, do not try to fit in. You are made to be different. Jesus is going to continue to talk in the Sermon on the Mount, which we're going to cover the next few weeks. He's going to talk about worry. He's going to talk about lust. He's going to talk about anger. He's going to talk about loving your enemies. He's going to talk about how we should be responding in situations differently than uh, those who don't claim to have a relationship with Jesus. He does not tell them, in other words, let them read your belief statements about me. And then they'll glorify your Father in heaven. It's they should see something different about your character. A few years ago, I was talking to a young man who was dating one of my wife's friends. He was an agnostic. He said that one of his biggest hesitations or um, uh, re reasons why he was resistant to Christianity, it wasn't what they claim to believe, as crazy as some of the stuff that we claim to believe is. He said what it was was that the friends that he hung out with who were Christians partied in the same way he partied. He's like, there was no difference about them. They partied the same way. They found the same, they were looking to the same things that I'm looking to for joy. So what do they have to offer me, in other words? Which is ironic, because I often hear a lot of people who claim to be Christians have this idea that if I can just be cool and fit in with the rest of the world, then the rest of the world will see that, oh, Jesus can be cool too. And anybody who's cool is like, I'm not, looking for, <laughs> I'm not looking for a cool Jesus. I'm looking for something I don't have. That's what this guy was telling me. It was like, I, I, could, I don't need a Christian to party with. I need somebody who's going to be a light to point me in a direction that I am not aware of yet. Like a witness on a stand. Um, a, you know, a prosecution. It's a murder trial. A prosecution calls a witness uh, for the prosecution. And they, they claim to have seen a murder. They're an eyewitness to a murder, right? What they say could be true. If the defense can erode the credibility of the witness, can make them look like a drunkard or uh, like they cheated on their taxes, somebody that can't be trusted, then the jury might go, I don't know if I can trust what they're saying about seeing the murder. It doesn't mean, if they're, let's say they're a, they're, a, they're, a, they're a drunk. It doesn't mean what they claim to have seen isn't true. It could be true, but it raises questions. And the same thing for Christians. Even though the foundation is the resurrection of Jesus and your bad character doesn't mean that Jesus didn't raise from the dead, it certainly raises questions about the credibility of you as a witness, as a, your testimony. If you claim, oh, Jesus changed my life, but actually it's pretty much the same as yours. I get angry the same way you get angry and I react the same way you react. And if you look at my social media posts, it's pretty much the same thing as you then it erodes the credibility of our witness. So don't try to be different because we're made, I mean, don't try to fit in because we're made to be different. Jesus, if he's alive and his spirit comes to dwell in us when we trust in him, then we're remade in his image to be different. That's number one. They're going to get shorter as they go on, by the way. Number two, we are not to do good for our own glory, but God's glory. It's not about getting pats on the back. Jesus is actually going to say in Matthew 6, don't give to the needy, don't fast, don't pray in order to be seen. In order for people to go, wow, look at you, look at how pious you are, how religious you are, that's amazing. Don't do it for those reasons. But here he said, let your good works shine before men. So what's it, is he contradicting himself? No, it's two sides of the same coin. The, the, the emphasis, in other words, is not on do good so that people see you. It's on let your faith impact your whole life. Let your faith impact your whole life. Don't be, um, uh, com don't compartmentalize. We saw this as a result of the Enlightenment where we, we, you know, people were, uh, had this I idea that your faith has to be privatized. You know, just keep it over here. Keep it separate from your vocation and your education and uh, your, your political life. Keep it all separate in nice little compartments. You got your Sunday life. And then you got your Monday through Saturday life. That, that, Jesus is saying, no, 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 don't do that. Don't, it's, it's meant to impact everything. In fact, part of our, this is our vision statement. To be an authentic, inclusive, and sending community where the grace of Jesus Christ transforms every area of our ordinary lives. Transforms every area. It should affect everything. If you're married, your faith in Jesus, him, 
living in you should make you, your marriage, look different. That doesn't mean you'd be fake and phony about your marriage and hide your troubles. But it also doesn't mean that you hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness. There should be a way that you disagree and fight with your spouse that is different than if you didn't know Jesus. If you're single, how you live out your singleness should be different than as if you didn't know Jesus. There should be a contentment in knowing him that doesn't leave you going, man, I am incomplete. Without a spouse. If you're a business person, you own a business, how you run your business should be affected by your relationship with Jesus. You should not be known as this ruthless, cutthroat, the ends justifies the means kind of person, cutting corners. No, known for your integrity, being above reproach. Not, not serving at the soup kitchen on Sunday morning with your church and then being a jerk to your co-workers Monday through Friday. It should affect everything. That's Jesus' point. His point isn't um, do good deeds so that people pat you on the back. It's let your faith impa- I- impact everything so that people will say, man, his faith must be real. I, I, he, what he believes is crazy, but he must really believe it because it impacts everything. That's number two. Number three, our joy in the midst of pain is just as important as external deeds. We started with verse 11. Let me, let me show that to you again. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, you are the salt of the earth. Your joy in the midst of persecution is one way that you are to stand out, be different. Your ability to have joy, to have peace during hardships and tribulations and pain and discomfort should be magnified because of knowing Jesus than if you didn't know him. It should make others go, wow, how can they be so joyful when they're going through what they're going through? I can't imagine having that kind of joy, that kind of peace. That's part of being salt and light, is having a joy that stands out. One of the best books I've ever read was a, is a book called Columbine. It was about Columbine, the Columbine shootings in 1999, April 20th. And um, it was written by a journalist who I don't know if was a Christian or not. He, he took 10 years. He was on the scene. He took 10 years to write it. I was recently telling Jeff back there about it. And so it, it popped in my mind this morning, actually, um, he, he, there's like a, a section of the book where he talked about the parents of the kids who were Christians who were killed. Um, when they received news on that day, April 20th, that afternoon, that your child was shot today in school and dead, there was a marked difference, he said, between the parents who were Christians versus the parents who were not. There was a marked difference, and there, there was a peace that undergirded their pain, their grief, their heartache. The, and they, were, they went and comforted the others. And again, I, I, there's no indication that this journalist was a Christian. He was just observing the difference that he saw. There should be a difference in our ability to rejoice during pain. Number four, the hope of the resurrection motivates us to live differently. So that the future hope of the resurrection, if we really believe it, It should motivate us. So me giving this sermon shouldn't make you walk out of here feeling guilty and feeling like, oh, man, I got to do better. I'm kind of a jerk. I got to do better. Like out of willpower and let me suck it up and be nice to that coworker who I really hate. That's not what I'm talking about. It's a motivation because if Jesus is alive, if he rose from the dead, and he says, I'm going to raise you from the dead too, and I'm going to return one day, and I'm going to usher in my kingdom, and you're going to inherit the earth with me. If that's coming, it loosens the grip that we have on the things of this world. And when that grip is loosened, then we are less tempted by the things that Jesus is going to talk about. So, for example, worry. Naturally, we have a lot of reasons to worry. Uncertainty. Things you can't control. Things that are coming your way that you think you can control, if only you strategize and analyze and plan and manipulate and then you find out you can't. 
But if we belong to a God who's coming back and who's going to renew this earth and who's going to raise us, the worst that can happen is, and people are experiencing this around the world, they're getting their heads chopped off because of their faith. And Jesus is saying, hold, hold loosely to the things of this world, including your own life, and you can rest in your Father's arms knowing he's got you in the end. He's got you. This, this life is a blip. It's a moment. You, you can hold loosely to the things that you tend to worry about. What you, whatever you worry about, hold loosely to it. Anger and revenge he's going to get into. We get angry. We're, 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 we're quick to get angry, quick to be vindictive when our joy is rooted in things needing to be fair. Our joy is rooted in there needing to be justice. Well, you disrespected me. Now I got to disrespect you back because there needs to be some kind of vindication. But if we belong to Jesus, then that means we belong to someone who we claim to believe will usher in this perfect kingdom of justice one day. He'll take care of things justice-wise. And so we can rest in him. We don't have to be vindictive. We don't have to get revenge. We can actually... Love our enemies. Love the people who are not loving us back. Even if those people are sometimes in our own homes. We can love them back. Well, that's not fair. You don't need things to be fair. If you really believe what you claim to believe. There's a future hope. And then number five, the power of the resurrection frees us to live differently. That's a different. Slightly different than number four. Number four... The hope of the resurrection motivates us to live differently. Because you know what's coming in the future. But number five is the power of the resurrection frees us to live differently. Again, think about what Christians, if you're here, you're not one. I get it. Some of the things we claim to believe are crazy. But we believe. If you believe this, this is what you're saying you believe. That you trust in Jesus. It's a risen Savior whose spirit then comes to live in you. The spirit that rose him from the dead lives inside of you. So as hard as it may be to love your enemies, you've got his power that rose a dead person from the grave living in you to give you the power to love your enemies. Giving you the power to not worry when under any other circumstance, if you didn't know him, you'd be worried. You've got his power in you giving you the power to do the commands in the Sermon on the Mount that seem impossible when we try to put them in the action. Everybody loves the Sermon on the Mount, in theory. I just try to follow the commands of Jesus. Nobody can follow the commands of Jesus on our own. But if we really have this resurrection spirit in us, it gives us power to do what seems impossible. And then, imagine, imagine that we took this seriously. This, the scandals would be gone. Right? The things that you see in the newspapers about, oh, this pastor got caught up in this, and this Christian did this. He'd be like, wow, if they were actually living as if the resurrection was a future hope and a present source of power. So many of those things would be gone. Pain and suffering. Again, you don't just have pain and suffering. I mean, you don't just rejoice, I'm sorry, you don't just rejoice in suffering because, oh, I know that one day, one day I'm going to be risen. Like, that's, that's part of it. But there's a Holy Spirit inside of you that gives you this, this power to have joy and peace. That's the promise. Charles Spurgeon, who was a 19th century preacher, he has this famous quote. I'm going to butcher it. It wasn't in my notes. It kind of just came to me this morning. Um, but it's one of my favorite quotes. He said, ask any parent who has buried a dear child. The natural result of affliction is hard-heartedness, bitterness, pestilence, railing your fist against God. But then he says, but what a marvelous thing when that heart is renewed by the Holy Spirit. Then it can actually make you softer, kinder, more thankful, quicker to praise God. Some of you guys have experienced that. In disappointment and pain. So those are the five things. Um, a- as I end, I'm going to call the band up for just a moment of re- just kind of reflecting. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to put some 
uh, questions on the screen just for us to reflect on. And we can kind of dim the lights for a moment and just, just reflect. And then the band's going to lead us in, in a song that we're going to... Sorry, Mandy. The dock gives us less space up here. Again, just reflect. Don't yell out these answers. <laughs> Not that I think you would, but... Am I becoming more like Jesus? Not looking for you to come and tell me, Pastor Chris, I sure am. <laughs> no, no, no. This is between you and God. Are you becoming more like Jesus? Th and again, if you're here and you're, I was talking to a family member last night who was at the service last week, and they said, I, I don't believe that the stuff you talked about is true. Okay. You know, so uh, if they came back today, I'd say they're, they're off the hook for this one, right? But if you claim to believe and you have his Holy Spirit, are you becoming more like Jesus? It's a, it's, a, it's a long, bumpy road, that process. But can you look back a year ago and go like, yeah, God's freeing me. He's loosening my grip on some things. Am I wasting my life on what is trivial in light of eternity? Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Valuable. You, centurions were paid in salt, in part at least. That's where we get the word um, salary from. It was their salarium. Sal you know, salt, salarium. You're not worth your, you know, weight in salt. You know, that, that phrase, that's where we get it from. They're paid. Salt was valuable and it was necessary. You're valuable. It's necessary. Are you wasting that? Chasing after things that the rest of the world chases after. Am I driven by the same desires, fears, and lusts as the rest of the world? If so, confess it to God. We all get caught up. Me too. Confess it. Take a moment. Yes, Lord, right now I am too driven by fill in the blank. Am I reacting to hardships as if God is not good or not in control? Is God good? Do you believe it? Is God in control? Did he really raise the dead? Is he really going to do that for you? Do you believe it? Take a moment. Take a moment. I'm just going to pray for us. Is that a Bible? Or I'm going to read a scripture over us before I pray. It's from 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 2 Corinthians 5.14 says this. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might, no, might, might, not, might, <clears throat> excuse me, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The love of Christ compels us. We are convinced 
One died for all so that we could die to ourselves, our pride, our egos. And now we're called to live for the one who died and rose again on our behalf. Jesus, that's what you call us to. Thank you for being so gracious when we screw up. Thank you for being so gracious when we forget what you've done for us. Forget how good you are. Forget how much you are sovereign over even our pain. You have invested your spirit into us. You've put your spirit into us. You died for us. You've got a kingdom that we get to be part of, and yet we uh, forget that. Thank you for forgiving us. But God, we ask that you would give us the grace, the power to repent, to turn, to stop chasing after the things we chase after and to trust fully in you. We want to shine with your light. We want to be your salt on the earth. Making an impact for you. Not so that we would get glory and fame and recognition, but so that you would. I pray that you would check our motives when we go to do something. God, check our motives. Stop us if we're doing it in order for us to get pats on the back. But when we're fearful about doing something for you, I pray that you would give us the boldness to step out and do it. Help us to know the difference. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, we're going to end today a little bit different. We're not going to sing a song together, although you're welcome to sing if you want to. But the, the, the band is going to sing a song over us, and there's going to be kind of a video montage playing in the background. Um, and so I, I just invite you to take it in. Um, it's just about, a, it's a song about how we're called to reflect the glory of God, to, to reflect that glory on this earth, our call as followers of Jesus. So let this hit you. <laughs>